Hi, Chris Deleon here for LMC 6310. Again, I'm a TA for this course, Computers and Expressive Medium here at Georgia Tech. This is the latest in a series of videos for helping people get started in programming using processing. And this one we're starting to move towards some game stuff, which the final project in the course is about. Uh, this is the course website, again, for people who are maybe not at the school and just sort of following along, uh, even though this course is designed for review for students who are taking the course. We are, as usual, using processing. Unity is an option for Project 3 at the time this video is being made, uh, but there's separate support being provided for that in lab versus some of the skills we're still covering in processing because we want that to be an option as well for people that have been comfortable with that technology all along. Processing, again, is free from processing.org, and we're going to start getting right into it. Now, the approach we're going to take for this one is we're going to build some artificial intelligence, some simple artificial intelligence, but something that visibly behaves a little bit like an animal or like human characters might, we're going to be a little abstract about it. But the process for this is rather than me walking you through step by step how to write the code at first, I first want to provide a series of instructions here. You'll see I have a series of 11 instructions spelled out. I'm going to describe these. And now that we're far enough along in using processing, my hope is that you can get some of this working on your own, maybe even all of it, at least as a first attempt, and then we'll go over how I would do it to compare and contrast to your solution to these challenges. So, the first thing I want you to try to do now we're going to kind of like I say, read through these first, is just set the screen size to 640 by 350. Uh, you can set it to any size you want, but that way we're just on the same page about our dimensions on the screen. Uh, as a clue for that, remember there's always two functions that we use every time we start a new processing sketch that's going to be working in real time. That's void draw and void setup. And one of those is a function you can call to set those parameters. Then I want you to draw a 20 by 20 green rectangle centered under the mouse. Draw a 20 by 20 red rectangle that begins near the top left corner of the screen. So we're going to have a green rectangle, which will be the player, kept under the mouse. And we'll have a 20 by 20 red rectangle, or square rather, that will begin near the top left corner of the screen. And that's going to be our artificial intelligence at first. Now for any frame, when the red rectangle is to the left of the green one, have it move two pixels to the right. So, of course, again, any frame, it's going to mean an avoid draw. But if your red rectangle is left of your player, your green rectangle, have it move closer to it by two pixels to the right. For any frame when the red rectangle is above the green one, have it move down two pixels. So just like we have it working on the x-axis, I also want you to have it working on the y-axis as well, chasing, so if it's above it, it's going to move closer to us two pixels per frame. Next up, uh, next two steps are basically extensions of it, the previous two. So we had it uh, moving to the right if it's left of us, we had it moving down if it's above us, but now we're also going to say if it's to the right of us, if, if the red rectangle is to the right of the green one, have it move two pixels left each frame. For any frame when the red rectangle is below the green one, have it move up two pixels. So at this point we basically just have a red rectangle which should chase our mouse around. We should be able to move the mouse, which is always going to have a green square under it, and there should be a red rectangle which whenever it's not overlapping the mouse is chasing to get closer under it. Here's where things start to get a little more ambitious. If you've been comfortable so far, great. And, and again, if you're following along the video, I encourage you, especially if you've been watching the previous processing videos, to pause the video now. And to take a shot at doing this first part before you move into these bigger steps, and before I start showing the solution of how I would do it, as just sort of something in case someone's uh, having trouble with a part of it, I'm going to show you a solution to all this. But first, try to follow along the steps one through seven, if you haven't yet. Set the screen size, get two rectangles, a green one and a red one and then have the red one chase the green one so you can move your mouse around have the red one try to follow after it. Okay, now if you've hopefully you're up to that point, if you're still curious though here in the rest of the steps or if you've come back after pausing it, the next step is to create an array list of class instances that manage an arbitrary number, let's say 12, of different red rectangles that behave as described above but in a different optionally random position, or they start in different positions. So whereas previously we had hard-coded to have a single red rectangle chasing your mouse cursor, the green mouse square, now we want to have an array list that's going to manage 12 different red boxes that'll start in different positions on the screen, let's say random, and chase the mouse from wherever they start. If you followed again previous processing videos, you should have some ideas about how array lists work to get a, a set of objects to use the same behaviors of a class. Step nine. If your red rectangles are still using int or integer positions, change them to use float and give each red rectangle a different speed, randomly assigned, at program start. 
Speed might be in the range, for example, of 0.5 up to 4.5 pixels per frame. So the idea here is that before you do this, all your rectangles are probably moving, as we described earlier, at two pixels every single frame. And if they're all moving at the same speed, they're going to quickly overlap each other. But this way, we're going to say that right when the program starts, each red rectangle is going to get assigned a different speed. Some will move very slow at 0.5 pixels per frame. Some move, might, might, might move much faster at 4.5 pixels per frame. And to support those granular differences in speed, not just the even number, or not just the whole numbers, one, two, three, and four pixels per frame, we're going to switch from using int positions for the positioning of your uh, AI rectangles to using float values, which allow us to have discrete values. For step 10, and again, if you're following, I really recommend you pause this, try what we're up to so far, and come back to the instructions. But for 10, have each rectangle only semi-periodically, let's say every 0.3 to 1.6 seconds, update the position that it's taking, that it's tracking. If it gets to its goal position earlier, it can either wait until its time runs out, or it can then update its target position. So the idea here is that instead of having them all chase your mouse constantly, Every 0.3 to 1.6 seconds, only then is it going to stop and reassess where it should go. And then it's going to pick a spot where the player was at that moment, and that's going to be its new destination it's going to track towards, even if the mouse moves away from it. If it gets to that destination before its time runs out, you can either have it wait there until its time runs out and then update its position, or you can have it decide, okay, I'm close enough, I'm going to pick a new target, I'm going to update my position to where the player is now. And this semi-periodic update of AI actually helps give it a lot more dynamic look when you have a herd of them, say 12 in our example, because they're all going to be working asynchronously from each other and chasing different spots and wind up sort of better flanking the player or spreading themselves out in the play field as opposed to all piling up, as might happen otherwise. Step 11, the final part. Support a wander mode for the AI rectangles. Each time they update the mouse position they track towards, there should be a 35% chance of being in wander mode for that time interval. In wander mode, they should track toward a random coordinate instead of the mouse position and be drawn yellow instead of red. So what this is about is that previously, they all would track towards where the player was and they'd update the position only periodically, 0.3 to 1.6 second intervals. But now we want to have a separate mode where 35% of the time, or about a third of the time, uh, when the AI updates its coordinate to track towards, instead of looking for the player, it's going to pick a random spot on the field turn itself yellow instead of red, and then wander to the random destination. That's going to help spread them out on the field and result in them uh, sort of like looking like they're teaming up on the player because they're going to be coming at them from all different directions or her from all different directions. They're going to wind up filling the screen space better, using the play field more effectively as a team, simply by this random wander feature supported by all the AI. So there's our steps. Once again, 1 through 7 are a lot more straightforward. 640 by 350 window. 20 by 20 green rectangle and a red rectangle. Have the red rectangle chase the green rectangle two pixels on either axis, every single frame and update. Then we're going to create an array list with a class instances of the red rectangle, 12 of them. That'll all chase the mouse and they're going to start in different positions on the screen randomly. We're going to switch those positions of the rectangles from int to float. We're going to give each of them a random speed at start. That they're, so they'll all move at different rates, all the red rectangle AI units. We're going to each rectangle only update its position every 0.3 to 1.6 seconds so that they will be chasing where the player was instead of where the player is, and so it'll help spread out the AI. And then lastly, we're going to support a wander mode. So about a third of the time, uh, any given AI unit will turn itself yellow and run to a random position on the screen before it then reconsiders whether it should chase where the player was, sort of updating its coordinate for that or whether it might even do a wander another time. There's the 11 steps. If you haven't tried these yet, I really hope you'll pause the video, give these a shot. I think you're gonna learn something in the process. Even if you think you know how to do it, I think you're gonna learn more from making yourself try to do what you know how to do, practice as they say, uh, as opposed to just following along with me as I'm gonna type the solution next. But if you've already tried it and you're here for the solution, let's go ahead and start doing that together and see what this looks like. So I'm, gonna just, I'm gonna roll the window over here so I can make it a little smaller. So first of all, like I said, Every processing application we write is going to avoid setup and avoid draw. Pretty common for almost any program. It's interactive in real time to have a function called at the start and a function called every frame. So, okay, step one is to set the screen size to 640 by 350. 640 pixels wide, 350 pixels tall. Let's press play. It's good to press play pretty frequently to 
make sure our program does what we think it does. And here's our window, which, as we expected, is 640 by 350. So far, so good. Draw a 20 by 20 green rectangle under the mouse. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's draw, let's call a rect. We're going to set the fill color uh, green. So it's zero red, full green, zero blue. Remember, it's a 255. 0 to 255 scale for color, due to being 8-bit color, or 8-bit per channel. Uh, now a rectangle is 20 by 20. Remember the arguments for a rectangle are the top left corner, uh, x and y, and then the width and the height of the rectangle. So top left corner, let's say mouse x minus 10, mouse y minus 10. That's gonna, what we're doing here is we're gonna center it on the mouse, because that's part of the instruction for step two. Width and height will be 20 by 20 and we have it drawn half of its width over, half of its width up to center it on the mouse. Now, of course, we're going to have a smudge. There's our smudge. You can see it's centered on the mouse coordinate, but we're smearing it because we're not yet clearing the background. I didn't really describe that step here, but I think it almost goes without saying it's usually assumed that we want to be able to clear the background. So I'm going to add background zero. Remember, this is the same as setting the fill color to black and then setting a rectangle the size of the screen. It's just going to erase over the previous frames so that they don't pile up on us like when you install Solitaire in old Windows or when you used to use Internet Explorer and it would freeze up your desktop again in Windows. Next up, we're going to draw a 20 by 20 red rectangle that begins near the top left corner of the screen. Well, okay, well, let's sort of do this one step at a time just like it's being instructed. We could, of course, skip ahead and there's a better way we could do this. We're going to start right where we're at. So we're going to draw it near the top left corner of the screen. Let's say 50 pixels in. 50 pixels from either edge, 20 by 20. And to make this one red, let's have full red, no green, no blue. And sure enough, here's our red rectangle, 20 by 20, beginning near the top left corner of the screen. So far, so good. Now for any frame when the red rectangle is to the left of the green one, have it move two pixels to the right. Now in order to move its position, we're gonna have to replace this constant, which right now is 50 every single frame of the program, it would never change. We have to replace that with a variable so that we can increase and decrease it to change the position of the rectangle on the screen. So I'm going to go up here, say int uh, AIX. Okay, that's going to be artificial intelligence X to represent the X coordinate. And I'm going to start that at 50. So it'll be 50 pixels over when the program starts. I'm going to replace the horizontal value of the red rectangle with that X value, but I'm also going to subtract 10 to keep it centered, just like I do for the player mouse X and mouse Y. I know I've mentioned before, so there is a way to change, I think it's probably rect align, uh, align rect. Anyway, there's a way to change the alignment of rectangles in processing so they're automatically centered instead of doing the offsets. I actually do find that programming the offsets manually for the top left corner is good practice, since it's often something we also have to do when we're manipulating images and bitmaps, which is much more common as we move towards games. So. For any frame when the red rectangle is to the left of the green one, have it move two pixels to the right. Okay, well, let's, so we've got some draw code. Let's, let's put some logic code at the top of draw. Remember, so even though it's called draw, it just means it's getting called every single draw frame. We can still do logic in here, and in processing almost always do. So for any frame, if the red rectangle, AIX, is to the left of the green one, so the green one's at mouse X, and the AI one horizontally is at AIX, because that's where we're drawing it. So if it's left of it, meaning less than on the screen, the coordinate value, then we're going to move it two pixels to the right. So we're going to add two pixels if it's to the left of us. Uh, let's just save this as like um, AI chase. Okay. Just reflex saving. There we go. So now you'll see if I go to the right of the ball, to the right of, I'm sorry, the red rectangle. It'll chase towards me pretty quickly. It ignores me if I'm above or below or left of it, but for now, we're just on step four, so it's chasing to the right. Now, for any frame the red rectangle is above the green one, have it move down two pixels. Let's do the same trick here. We had AIX, let's have AIY. Same comparison, so if we are above the green one, the green one is mouse Y, Notice that this is AIY for the Y coordinate, the up and down. Remember too that in graphical coordinates on a computer screen, typically, especially for two-dimensional stuff, positive Y is actually down as opposed to up like it is in geometry class. So if it is less than us, meaning it is above us on the screen, we're going to add two every frame 
to make it move down two pixels. And sure enough, again, it'll ignore me if I'm up and to the left of it, but if I go right, it'll go to the right. If I go down, it'll... Oh, tell you what I didn't do yet. I did the math for this variable, created this variable in memory, gave it an initial value, changed the value, but I did not replace the coordinate of the red rectangle with it. So we're changing the number, we have to use the number for the course to show up on the screen. So this 50 here, which was currently locking it at 50 pixels from the top of the screen always, I'm going to change it to AIY minus 10. And again, the minus 10 here is because that's half the width of our NPC dimensions. Which right now we're just sort of keeping simple. So yeah, and there we go. Now when I move down, it's going to chase down. Move right, it's going to chase right. And if I go down to the right, it's going to chase me diagonally. Just like that. Okay, now for number six. For any frame when the red, when the red rectangle is to the right of the green one, have it move two pixels to the left. Okay, we're going to copy and paste this if statement. That check if we were left and moved right. So you can see I pasted it there. We now have two that are, that are momentarily identical. And this bottom one, doesn't matter if I do a bottom or top, I'm going to check and see if we are greater than mouse x. So if we're to the right of it, then I'm going to subtract 2. Keep in mind, like numerically what's going on, if the number is greater than, so subtracting 2 is moving us nearer to that value, which spatially we're representing here as it's chasing towards our mouse. So now it'll go left and right to chase the green square. In addition to down, but we haven't handled up yet. Up is step seven. For any frame when the red rectangle is below the green one, have it move up two pixels. I'll do the same thing I did for x. I'm going to copy and paste the y comparison. So we momentarily have two that look identical. Could change either one. I'm going to change the second one. And instead of checking if I'm above it, meaning less than, I'm going to check if I'm below it. So if the AI coordinate is greater than mouse y, when we were blown on the screen, how do we make these two numbers come closer together? Well, since it's greater than it, we subtract the two, and that's going to move it up on the screen closer. So at this point, we have a red rectangle, which will pretty aggressively chase after our mouse cursor, which you can see is sort of a beginning point for thinking about some really simple AI, some chase AI, or, or Terminator, as a book I read growing up used to refer to this type of AI. AI in big quotes. All right, so now we're about to get more ambitious. So if you've followed so far, and especially, again, if you've seen other processing videos from earlier in this series, I encourage you to try step eight before I show the solution, which is to create an array list of class instances that manage an arbitrary number, let's say 12 of these red squares that behave as described. Basically, we just want to take what we have now. We want to have 12 red squares to start in random positions on the screen and all chase the player character. I'm assuming, though, if you either haven't paused or maybe you already did it and tried it, I'm going to start showing the solution now. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new tab. I'm going to call that one, uh, let's see here, enemy. All right. Now we have a new tab in processing. Remember, I clicked this arrow and said new tab, and then I named it. We can use it either just as a section to pile code separately. So if I copy this AI character coordinates and put it in here, it's a, it's a shared same global space. And so likewise, I could define a function here. I could say void move AI, and here in void draw, where I had this logic for chasing after the player's mouse, I can cut all that text. Let me expand my window so you can better see what I'm doing. So I remove the code from before background. If I just call move AI there, it'll then call that label. Jump from here up to there. I'm going to paste the chase code. So there's our four if checks, which again, if we're left of it, move right. If we're right of it, move left. If we are above it, move down. And if we are below it, move up. By putting this label here, it's going to call that function. And just to stay organized, I can move that function by copying and pasting it into its own file over here with enemy. So now this file has both the coordinates for the enemy as well as the logic to move it. And while we're at it, See here, we're doing the red rectangle and drawing the rectangle for it. Let's make that a new function called draw AI. Having called it here, we still need to define that function. I'm going to go over to the other file. Void draw AI. Paste. And there we have setting the color to red, drawing the red rectangle there. So this will still do exactly the same thing as the program did before. It's now just a little bit better organized. 
as by splitting up into a separate file. And that's going to be our first step towards making a new class out of it. Just separating out the functionality there is a bit of refactoring. Move AI, draw AI. Now this is our whole main file now. Setup sets the screen dimensions, draw updates the AI position, does background, draws the AI. We have a draw player here, which we can make a separate function, but we don't really need to do that just yet. Let's focus on one thing at a time. Now that we have the enemy in its own file, let's turn this into a class. Class enemy. Remember it needs its own braces. Class enemy is going to be the name of our class. It's good in Java or a lot of languages really to keep the name of your tab, the name of your file, the same as the name of your class that's inside it. Open brace, and I close the brace at the end outside these functions. Now we want to fix the indentation on these. And there's a few ways we could do this. Uh, you could go to edit, auto format. It'll automatically handle the indentation for you. I like to select lines, hold down the command key, and then use the brackets. Brackets being, you know, the uh, these characters on the keyboard to manually shift in the lines. I find it helps me keep better control of my code. So I'm going to highlight the lines I want to indent. I hold command on Mac and use those brackets. On Windows, I imagine you can probably hold control or, or something similar. You can also tab and shift tab to scoot the whole block in or out. And to select lines, I hold shift and use up and down arrows. But okay, now that we've got our function functions and our uh, variables wrapped up here in enemy, let's take this a step. Well, we, we don't need. Let's not deal with the constructor yet. Uh, I was going to say so we could take these values instead of in initializing them here this way write an enemy constructor and set them inside there, that's probably be fine for now. So now we can't call move AI and draw AI just standalone like this. We have to create an enemy instance, enemy, let's say one enemy equals new enemy. Let's parse this, all right? Enemy is the name of our class, that's the type. One enemy is our label, you could call this George or Frank or Elephant if I felt like it. Anything I want, as long as that label is going to be the same everywhere in my code. Users can't see this, just the label for me. And because it's a, uh, a class and not just a simple type like an integer or a float, I need to declare a new, which is going to allocate the memory necessary for whatever variables it needs. So this will tell it, okay, it's going to involve two integers. That's all for this case. We might add some more in a little bit. And then enemy is calling the constructor on it, which by default, it's basically a blank one that doesn't change anything about it. And now instead of calling move AI and draw AI plane at a global level of scope, I call them on the enemy that we declared up there. So one enemy was our label. I'm going to call move AI and draw AI on it. We're still in step eight because now we have a class. We can create a array list of these guys or these girls, these things. See, and again, it's all doing the exact same thing. We're just refactoring at this point, but it's a really helpful step to be able to have a bunch of them take the code that was all written at a global level, at a simple, sort of straightforward, minimal variable usage level, split it off into its own file, then split it off into its own class. Because now, instead of declaring enemy one enemy, we're going to declare array list all enemies equals new array list. This is going to say there's an array list, which is a container for classes or instances of more complex data structures. All enemies is the name of that set. New array list is just like we had new enemy because it was a more complex data type than just a float or an int or some other primitive. Is going to set us up so we can start adding en enemies or any kind of entity really to this all enemies array list. Now down here I can say all enemies dot add new enemy, and I can do that multiple times. So this will give me three enemies right here. Sorry about that. All right, so we got three enemies there. Now, instead of being able to handle move AI and draw AI like this, because remember, this worked when enemy uh, was the type for one enemy, we we'll have to iterate through that array list. For int i equals zero, i is less than all enemies dot, think for a second, size, i plus plus. Sometimes in other programming languages, this is length. Sometimes it's with a capital L. Sometimes it's a function. Sometimes it's an array. Size, I'm pretty sure is what we want here in processing. Next, we need to get the enemy from that index in the array list. Enemy, each enemy, equals enemy, all enemies, dot, get, i, 
I, I probably apologize every time I've shown you this because it's kind of a wonky construction, but enemy is the type. Each enemy is the label, which is only going to last within this for loop. I then tell the computer to get me index 0, 1, 2 in this case because we have, we've added 3, so we have indexes 0, 1, and 2. The for loop is counting through those 0, 1, 2. Since there's 3 in the list, it's not going to actually hit 3. That gets me back that, that first enemy, that second enemy, that third enemy. Cast it as type enemy so that I can then load it into this data structure or load into this temporary reference. And then when I call each enemy dot move AI, it's going to call move AI for that particular enemy's coordinates. I'm going to copy that, paste that same code down here for draw AI. I'm just going to replace move AI with draw AI. And again, you'll notice that here I had to change. It said one enemy. Now it's each enemy because it's the reference to the current enemy that we're looping through. And there's other ways to write these loops that uh, are, are smarter about the data structures. Other ways to structure array lists so they know the type inside them. I find casting and, and writing primitive for loops useful practice for all kinds of other reasons in terms of how other programming languages work. But up to you if you want to find a more advanced way to do those. All right, so for now we should just have three enemies. We're going to set it up to 12 in a moment. Should move and draw them. But when we press play, that's not what we're seeing, right? We only see a single enemy. It's still working, which is good. That's, that's a good sign. But there's something missing, and the problem is all three of those enemies are overlapping. Let me prove that to you. Uh, so each of these enemies, if I iterate through them here, right after we've added them, and if I say, what's the number variable? AIX, for example. If I set AIX to 50 plus 100 times I, okay, so think about what this is doing for a second. We've added some enemies. Now for every enemy that we've added to the array list, get each enemy one at a time, and change its X position at the start of the program in void setup. So this only happens once when the program starts. 50 pixels over plus I times 100. So this will put enemy 0 at 50 pixels. Enemy 1 at 150. Enemy 2 at... Wait, yeah, 250. There we go. And now when I press play, you'll see they start separated and they rapidly converge onto the player. Let me show you again. It spread out their start positions and then they rapidly converge. Now, a good way to randomize their positions is right now we're setting these to 50 by 50 in the enemy. We don't want to have to write code outside of the enemy class to randomize their positions because that's something the enemy should be able to do for itself. Let's write a constructor for the enemy. Oh, made a little error. Now I'm actually going to use that to call attention to a common error. So in order to make a constructor, we don't put a void on it. We don't put an int or anything because it's returning the type of itself, if that makes any sense. Or rather, it's, it's, a, it's a very special case. Uh, so now when we declare enemy, let's get rid of these default initialization values for x and y. We don't want to always start in the top left. We want them to start in random positions. Equals random width. AI y equals random height. Okay. So now the horizontal position will be randomized. The vertical position will be randomized. And width and height will already exist because we have set size to 64350 before we're calling the enemy constructors. Again, if we did this in reverse order, if we put these above size, if we put these, say, here, then we're going to end up, the enemies all clumped in the corner because it don't, the processing won't know yet that width and height need to be these values until we've set them earlier in the code. So this will execute, and then these will execute. This should now wrap up. So random returns a float value. So right now, for, for the moment, we want to use int values for our positions because that's what we've talked more about. And to get that float value to be treated as an integer, I'm just going to put quest, uh, parentheses int in front of it. It's very much the same thing as we do here when we cast the general object type that comes back from the array list as type enemy. This is saying, okay, I know there was a float here. I am deliberately shoving this into an int. Just cut off the float part. Just cut off the decimal value. So if it was 7.7, .7, make it 7. If it was 80.3, make it 80, and so on. Okay, when I press play, you'll see they start in random positions. And they still really rapidly converge, but they were there. Now to make 12 enemies, I could copy and paste these three, make that six, copy and paste those six, make that 12. This will create 12 enemies. And let me prove that to you. There's the 12 enemies. If you count them real fast, it's kind of hard. That's maybe not the smartest way to do it. Because anytime we're going to write the same code 12 times, of course, the better way to do that, and why we practice writing for loops, is saying int i equals 0, 
i is less than 12, i plus plus. Now this will give us one place to change the number of how many enemies we want to have on the screen. Because this is going to repeat this for loop 12 times. It's going to start at 0. As long as it's less than 12, it's going to add an enemy and increment that number by 1. i plus plus is the same as i plus equals 1. Same as i equals i plus 1. So all enemies is going to add 12 enemies to the screen. And again, if I press play, there it goes. And the handy thing about this, if I want to suddenly have 120 enemies, I just put a zero there. Now we got 120 enemies. And again, they're going to rapidly converge into a single entity because our algorithm is so deterministic right now and so constantly updated. We'll fix that in a sec. So first, let's put this back to 12 because we now completed step eight. We have an array list of class instances to manage an arbitrary number, arbitrary number you can change as 12 to anything else, of red rectangles that behave as described above but start in different random positions. Now step nine. And again, if, if, I encourage you to pause if you hear this step, if, you, if you're caught up to this point and want, want to try it for yourself. If you're, you're thinking you're going, to learn, you're going to learn a lot more writing code before I show you what to do. Uh, if your red rectangles are still using end positions, change them to use float. Give each red rectangle a different speed at program start. Could be anywhere from 0 0.5 to 4.5 pixels per frame. Nine's a much easier step than eight is, but of course it relies upon us having finished step eight to get to it. So red rectangles are still using int positions. They definitely are. We're going to change those to use float. So here where it said int, make that float. And again, the difference is an integer is only whole numbers. Negative five, negative three, zero, two, eight, nine, fifty-seven, a thousand. Um, floats allow us to have decimal precision. So it could still be a thousand, it could still be eighty, it could still be negative five or zero, but it could also be 0.3, 90.7, negative 80.3, whatever. Um, floats give that decimal precision, which is going to let us have speeds that vary on finer increments than just in whole numbers. Okay? Because we did that, we can actually get rid now of this integer cast, because we actually want the random number generator to return us a float. We also want to have a random speed value for the figure. Okay, well, let's, let's think about how we do this. So the speed value right now is 2 for all of them. You can see this 2 right here. There's our 2s. And if we just start thinking locally, for example, we might say here, float my speed, because we know we want this character to have a speed. Actually, let's be consistent. Let's call it AI speed, since we have like this AIX convention from the previous file. Okay, so AI speed, and we might say AI speed equals, we want 0 0.5 plus random value of up to four point of up to let's say four, which will give us the range of so if we can get up to four, we add 0.5, that'll give us up to four point five. And also I believe the syntax works in Java slash processing. We could say random between these two values. Again, just because of how other programming languages often use random numbers, I find this sort of formatting a useful way to think about it and sort of more gen more generalizable. Between half a pixel and four pixels. Now the problem is, let's actually let's, let's go ahead and stick this number in there first. So AI speed there, and I can put it into each one of these places in spot, in spot of the two. Now instead of moving at two pixels every frame, it's going to move a random speed between 0 0.5 and 4.5. And hopefully you already see the problem, but let me demonstrate it before we fix it. When I press play, here's all of our entities, they're still overlapping. They're still on average catching up to each other. It's a little more random. You definitely can see more of a flock going on than we did before, more of a herd. But the problem is that this value isn't persistent. You'll see the instruction for number 9 says that we want to give each red rectangle a different speed at program start. So whereas move AI is called every single frame, so it keeps picking a new speed every frame, on average then they're all going to move about the same distance. Because some frames, any given one of them might be 0.5 speed, some frames, any given one of them might be 4.5, and like I say on average they're going to work out to be roughly the same distance. So what we need to do instead is we need persistence to that variable. So here, float AI speed, instead of making it local to that function, I'm going to move that float AI speed, just cut and pasted it, into the class level, or sort of global within the class, if you will. So AI speed still won't be directly accessible outside the class without a class reference, say in the other files. But here within the file, we can reference it anywhere between these functions, and more importantly, it's going to persist between being set or being accessed. By persist, I just mean it's not forgotten at the end of the function. Let's move this code here that initialized it to a random value. Instead of being in move AI, which is called every single frame, since we're calling it every single frame, 
in void jar. Remember, there's nothing magic about any of this. It's happening because we programmed it to do just what it's doing. Move AI is called every single frame. But the constructor that sets up the position randomly is only called once at program start here in void setup. So let's move the AI speed assignment up into enemy. Okay. So we have a persistent value on enemy, and it's set to 4.5, half a pixel to up to four and a half pixels per frame. There we go. And then it's used in place of the twos down here in the move AI for how much to move if it's offset in a given frame. Now, I will say, and, and some of you may already realize this, we're going to cover in a later tutorial how to properly handle diagonal movement along uh, non-45 degree intervals. This is actually going faster than the speed when it moves diagonally because it's moving on both axes independently. Like I say, we'll tackle that on the next tutorial video for this class. Uh, but for now, what we should see is that some of them move very quickly, some of them move much more slowly, and in general, this does help kind of spread them out. You can see some very much lag behind. And when I press play again, I should actually get a different amount that lag behind. And it's just sort of dumb luck as to how many are super slow, how many are super fast. But you will see that they're very easy to manipulate. So if I run circles around them, they'll tend to clump up. That's something that uh, uh, is part of why circle strafing works so well in old first-person shooters. When you run a circle around things that are all chasing you independently, they, they on average keep moving towards the center because the further they are from the center, the more often you're on the other side of the circle from them. But we're going to fix that with the wander behavior here in a sec. Okay, so we've completed step nine. Now for step 10, it's going to be a little bit more involved, a little more interesting. Not quite as involved as eight. Have each rectangle only semi-periodically, say every 0.3 to 1.6 seconds, update the position that it's tracking toward. If it gets to its goal earlier, it can either wait until its time runs out, which is probably what we're going to do because it's kind of the default, or it could update its target position. Up to you. In that case, we would just check a distance against its target goal. All right, so let's, let's think this through. Have each rectangle is semi-periodically update its position that it's tracking towards. Well, first, let's think in terms of how we would do semi-periodic updates. It's going to be useful to keep track of a notion of how much time passes between frames. This might already be built into processing in a way. We're going to do it by hand because it's good practice for, like I say, a lot of other programming environments are going to have to do this our own way. Now, what we can do, uh, I will say first of all, that processing, I need this print line to show you the output here, has a super handy function for time purposes called millis. And millis, if you look down here at the print line, is how many milliseconds have passed since the program started. So when it says 5222, that means 5.2 seconds since the program started. When it says 10 point whatever, it's been 10 point whatever seconds since the program started because they're milliseconds, so 1,000 per second. Now what we can do is we can keep a delta of how many milliseconds pass between each frame. So let's do that. Let's say uh, int previmS. That's going to be how many milliseconds the previous frame was. And we'll say int delta ms for how many milliseconds pass between the previous frame and this one. That way we can set time for each AI, and we can subtract off it how many milliseconds pass between frames. Then it's going to be a little more clear when you see how it looks in action. So I declared these two global level values, delta milliseconds and previous milliseconds. And what I want to do at the top of draw, let's actually make an update timer function. See here at the top of draw, I made update timer. Void update timer. Now inside here, we grab these two variable names, they're going to be handy to us inside here. And of course I have to get rid of the int, because those ints would make them local versions. We want to use the global variables. All right, delta ms is going to equal millis minus prev ms, and prev ms is going to equal millis. Does that make sense? So we're going to update our timer. So the delta is going to be whatever milliseconds we have now minus what it was the previous frame. And then we're also going to save, we're going to update the time of the previous frame to whatever moment it is now. Does that make sense? Just to be safe, like, okay, this is probably all going to happen within a millisecond because it's a modern computer. Maybe we want to make absolutely certain that uh, we have the exact same number for both so we don't drop milliseconds anywhere. Int milliseconds is frame. Millis. This will ensure that we use the same number for both and that we don't wind up, like I say, theoretically, if here between this semicolon and this next one, processor skipped a millisecond, 
uh, we could potentially lose numbers, but no biggie. Close enough for players in any case, especially for this kind of demonstration. But So we're going to get the same number. We're going to store it once. You're going to use that to calculate the difference in time. So if the previous one was 500 and now it's 530, that's going to make delta MS 30 milliseconds. Then we're going to update this to 530, so the next time we're going to subtract from the previous frame's time. Now that we have this value, we're going to have a countdown timer on the AI. There's different ways to set up coroutines and timers and uh, spin-off threads with whatever. We're going to use sort of a very straightforward, old, old, old programming practice. Uh, it's not the most efficient or optimal thing to do, but it very much works when you're just rapid prototyping and getting something to work set up. So let's say int time till uh, tracking update. We're going to default that to zero, so it's going to start off ready to update its timer. And now on move AI, we're going to say if Oh, actually, sorry. First of all, we're going to subtract from time till tracking update delta ms if it goes below zero. Then we're going to set that. So, like I said, 300 to 1.3 to 1.6 seconds. 300 plus random 1300 milliseconds. Let's cast that to an integer, just like we did for the random before. So 1,300 milliseconds plus 300 milliseconds is 1.6 seconds. So this is going to give us a random range from 0.3 to 1.6 seconds. And so now every 1 point through, every 0.3 to 1.3 seconds is going to call whatever code is inside this if statement, because that's how long it's going to take for the delta milliseconds between frames to accumulate until it knocks out this timer that we've set. And then it's going to update the position that it's tracking toward. Okay, first off, let's slow down. Let's double check that this is a uh, function called. And let's add millis here as a time indicator so we know when it got called. Now the, uh, let's see, the other thing we're going to do, let's change it to have only a single enemy, just for a moment. And now watch the, the debug log down here. And you should see down here pretty, pretty infrequently about one to one and a half, about third of a second to one and a half seconds, it's going to update that value down there in the console log. And um, that's what we hoped so far. Let's go back to having 12 enemies. And now instead of doing that print line, we're going to update the position it's tracking toward. So see how before it was tracking mouse X and mouse Y in real time, so as these values changed, it was updating where it's tracking toward. Let's give it some new values to track. Int um, track at, let's see, uh, 2x, 2y, to to mean I'm going to there. 2x equals mouse x, so it's going to say wherever the mouse is at the moment that the timer for the AI update goes below zero. And then it's going to give it, like I say, another 0.3 to 1.6 seconds to wait. And now instead of comparing its position to the mouse x, mouse y, we just compare its position to 2x and 2y, which are only updated infrequently. See that? So now we've got the comparisons to these values, which we can update non-real-time, non-constantly. And even though this seems like worse AI, there's a few advantages. One, if it was a complicated thing we were doing to update the AI, then that's one reason why we often want it to be less frequent than every single frame, because it can just update its plan and then act on its plan and only periodically update its plan. Two is it just seems much more realistic for something to not constantly be alert, constantly updating, but to occasionally kind of reassess its situation and update its positions. And we'll see here that what we get is much, much, much more lagged behavior. See, if I come over here, it takes them a second, and they wind up tracing where I was when they updated their behavior code instead of where I currently am, which still results in them chasing me around. If I sit still, they'll still get to me. But it's a much more interesting group behavior, the way that my movement will lead them to spread out and go to look where I was instead of where I currently am. All right. And again, right now, by default, we have this wait until timer runs out. If we want to have it update its target position as soon as they're close enough, what we could do for that is we could say if dist, remember distance is a function built into processing that does the Pythagorean theorem, uh, we could write our own, but so if dist between mouse x 
I'm sorry, this between AIX, AIY, that's our X and Y coordinate of the character itself, that this, this particular enemy, uh, and 2X, 2Y, and its goal destination, is less than, let's say, is within its speed. So it's less than one, what's less than one turn away from getting there, or one movement from getting there. Uh, in fact, let's uh, let's give it a, bit, a little bigger margin. That it's less than twice the speed gap from it. So it's getting near its destination. Then we can force this value to zero, which is going to throw us here on the, net, on the within the same frame and update its behavior. And now you'll never get them sitting around in the same way. They're going to be much more reactive, and that once they get to where the player was, they will immediately update and start chasing the player's new position as soon as they got the previous one. This is much more aggressive looking behavior as opposed to, again, without that, this is the other option. They'll wait their timer out, so you'll occasionally see them sit there and hesitate for a moment before they chase the player's new position. Now, another thing that we can do, uh, when I say we could write our own Pythagorean theorem, let's go do that, just as good practice before we do step 11, because it'll only take a second. I really want you to see how these things work. So let's say, um, find dist, Let's show you how distance is programmed. Float x1, float y1. So that's going to be x and y coordinate of one point. x2, y2 is going to be x and y coordinate of the other point. Okay. And now inside here, think about the second theorem, right? It's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Or the distance formula then is the square root of the square of the x distance and y distance added together square of the x distance plus the square of the y distance. We'll show you what I mean. All right, so then x difference equals x2 minus x1. y difference equals y2 minus y1. And now we want to return the square root of x difference squared plus y difference squared. Remember, squaring is just multiplying every time itself. And square root's a function built into processing or built into most math libraries. So instead of dist, the one built into processing, we could call find dist. And this is just a general math function, just showing exactly what dist does, which will have the exact same behavior it did before, giving them much more aggressive action updates, because they'll never hesitate for even a moment. As soon as they get to where they were chasing towards previously, they will immediately update their heading to where the player's new behavior is. And you can play with these values if you want to change uh, how often they update their behavior. If we want to say that a minimum three second wait between behavior updates, again, this is going to prove to you how much more aggressive the new behavior is. When we do the distance calculation, they're going to keep on moving. And if I turn off that distance check, so they're going to wait out their time before they update, by default, the mouse is coordinates zero, zero in the window. And so that's why I'll run to the left. And so now there's going to be a lot more waiting around because they won't update their position until their three seconds runs out. And you get a much more delayed behavior. So just like we, we change their speed and we, we asynchronously update when they track the player, we could also randomize between them their minimum time of update, for sort of a sense of alertness that differs between them, if we wanted to, to have them better stagger. But a better way to stagger them is this step 11. That's, it immediately adds to the difficulty of this environment. So here we have where we're at the end of step 10 where they're chasing the player's mouse, only, uh, only updating their tracking coordinate semi-infrequently. Now for step 11, we want to support a wander mode for the AI rectangles. So each time they update the mouse position they track toward, there should be a 35% chance going into wander mode for that time interval. In wander mode, they should track toward a random coordinate instead of the mouse position and be drawn yellow instead of red. This is not as complicated as it sounds, especially from the way the code's written so far. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a bool, remember uh, boolean, floats have decimal precision. Integers can be any whole number. Uh, Booleans can only be true or false. Uh, so I'm going to call this boolean is wandering. I'm going to default it to false. Like I say, it can only be true or false. Boolean is wandering. It's by convention, we often put an is at the start of a bool value. Just helps you know that it's not a number or whatever, not a countdown timer or whatnot. So is wandering is going to default to false. When we update the behavior, which remember is inside this if statement, because it means the timer ran out for updating its behavior, I'm going to say iswander will become 
Look at how I'm doing this. Random number of 100 less than 35. This will mean that there's a 35% chance of it being in wander mode. Think about that, because this is going to be a random value from 1 to 100. And so 35% of the time, it's going to be less than 35. Right? Thereabouts? Close enough. Now the other thing we're going to change, so we have this is wandering variable. Here in draw, if we're wandering, we're going to have one fill color, else we're going to have another. And so let's see, if we're in wandering mode, we want to draw it yellow, which yellow is full red value, 255, full green value, 255, no blue. If we're wandering, we're going to be yellow, otherwise we're going to be red. Let's not even worry about changing the behavior. Let's just, let's just double check that about 35% of the time, or as a group, about 35% of the group, should appear yellow. And this seems pretty accurate. Looks like any time we've got a few, maybe up to four-ish around there, out of the 12, who are turning yellow and chasing us. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but they're all operating independently, each with a 35% chance, each AI update, of going to wander behavior. But the last thing we're going to do, here I was setting 2x and 2y to the mouse position. I'm going to move that below is wandering's update. Here where that AI gets updated because build an if else. The idea here is that instead of updating the tracking position to the mouse, remember how we randomized the character start position in the constructor? See, so if we're wandering, instead of tracking towards the player, we're going to pick a random spot on the screen and wander towards that. Else, meaning that we're not wandering because this 35% check failed, then we're going to track towards the player instead. And because this is based on that same variable, it's also going to affect the coloration of the figure. And sure enough, when I press play, we should see red ones tracking straight at me, and yellow ones kind of going off and doing their own thing, including sometimes yellow will wander away from me, Sometimes yellow will go over to the other corners. And this actually makes, as a group, the whole set far harder to avoid because it winds up spreading them out, and then they switch right back to aggressive behavior and coming at you from different angles. And it just feels much more like there's a sense of teamwork or strategy, even though it's really just a lot of sheer chance and sheer numbers working against you as the player. And this is something, again, we can, we can play with those numbers. We could change it so the higher percentage of them are random, lower percentage, and so on. And the other beauty of this is, like I said before, if I'm going to have 1,200 enemies instead of 12, I just stick two zeros in there, press play, and there's our AI simulation, which this is actually going to even better demonstrate just sort of as a population how red's going to converge near me, yellows are going to help spread them back out over the play field, and you can see the cloud of red that follows behind me as yellow continues to fill out the space. So let's put this back down to 12, because that was the goal. And we've completed the, 12, the 11 steps from this instructional example. Hopefully it's been helpful. I'm going to keep trying to use this kind of format going forward now that we've covered enough basics of processing that I think you can often follow the steps before seeing how the code's written line by line. Uh, keep tuning in. If you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, please do. Um, there should be some other programming videos coming out here also for either people reviewing it for the class or if you're outside Georgia Tech just interested in following along with some basics in 2D real-time programming. Chris Leon for 6310 at Georgia Tech Digital Media. Thanks again. Bye-bye.